Genesis 18. Turn there very quickly. I made mention that I was going to talk about something tonight. And I shall do that. I shall do my best to do that, although I don't have all the answers. Currently, I believe all the answers are in the Bible. I believe the Bible has the answers to everything. Somebody say amen. And there's not anything that the Bible doesn't give an answer to. Including all those questions we ask God. God, why did you do this? God, why did you do that? The longer you read the scriptures, the more you understand. I uh, had a good meeting with uh, Brother Roy this afternoon. I was kind of dreading it. And uh, Roy ended up being a blessing to me. He just had a really, I could tell when I went in the room. He had a really, really sweet spirit on him. And I mentioned that to him. I said, Roy, I can tell you God's blessing you. I said, because if you don't mind me, me saying, but you just, have, you just seem like you have a really good spirit on you. And he went. And I know how Roy thinks and talks. And that meant me and the man upstairs was having a talk. So I think it, I think it helped him. Um. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is Sister Bonnie will probably not be with us for very long. Um, they haven't got the final word yet on everything. I think a cancer doctor is supposed to be in tomorrow to talk to him. Um, but she has cancer started out. In her left arm and shoulder. And there he said there's a big mass under her right arm. Uh, she has cancer on her kidney. Um, one breast. I, I don't remember which one it was. But there was. And there more than likely was a couple other spots. And I don't remember all of what he said. I was going to try to write them down as he was speaking to him, but I didn't want it to be that obvious. Uh, but the bottom line is they've given her somewhere in the neighborhood of six months. And that is basically untreated. She is not a candidate for chemotherapy. Um, and they said radiation would extend the life of the tumors it wouldn't wouldn't stop it in any way it would uh, I think make it not so painful but when I the whole time I was in the room she never uh, she never really moved she never really spoke she never woke up so she was already under uh, they had her on morphine Roy told me at that time uh, the, the blessing out of this, and this is something that I, I encouraged Roy to do. Um, he mentioned hospice program and he talked like they would put her on hospice and send her over back over here to the nursing home. I said, Roy, I don't think it has to be that way. I said, we, you, you and I talked and Lisa talked with Bonnie and um, basically the whole point of her being in the nursing home was she was because of the brain tumor she had that they had taken out she couldn't remember 30 seconds ago and if it took her any longer than 30 seconds to say something by the time she got to the end of what she was saying, she couldn't remember where she started out and didn't remember what she was talking about. And she had gotten to the point to where she would get up, she would go to get up out of her chair to go do something. And because it took so long for her to get out of her chair, by the time she got out of her chair, she forgot what it was she went to do. And... Um, so Lisa and I went over there and talked to him and her both. 
And she really did not want to go into a nursing home, but we just didn't really see any other choice then because of her condition. Roy was unable to leave the house for any length of time at all. And um, so they had her placed there and then COVID hit. If, if I'd have known COVID was going to hit, I would have never said, let's go to a nursing home. That's a good idea. I would have never said that. I would have said, keep her out of that place. Uh, but, you know, we just didn't know at the time. And um, so basically, if they put her in hospice and send her back over to the nursing home, any nursing home, they're going to lock the place down and he's not ever going to be able to see her. She basically is going to die in a prison which is not what anybody wants. It's not what Bonnie would want. I know that. It's definitely not what Roy wants. So in a way, the Lord had answered two prayers that Roy had been praying for quite a while. And one of them was that eventually she would be able to come home. And the other one was he had prayed that God would take her before he took him because he did not want Bonnie to endure the loss of her husband. Um, he was willing to take the loss of his wife. And I mentioned that to him. I said, Roy, I, you know, I can see that it looks like, you know, barring you pulling out of the hospital driveway here and a car smashing into the side of you, God is going to answer that prayer that she is going to pass before he does. But I would say also that if that something like that happened, Bonnie wouldn't know about it anyway. Um, because the, already the amount of morphine that they have her on. She has, she has a lot of cancer in her body. Cancer is a very painful way to die. And um, so in a hosp any kind of hospice program, um, there is someone there to administer... Um, large amounts of pain relief, which is both biblical and it is, um, it's a very humane thing to do. Uh, the book of Proverbs give wine to those and strong drink to those who are about, who are ready to perish, the Bible says. And in this case, the wine and strong drink is the morphine. And it basically just puts them completely out of their mind so they're not aware of anything, especially as time draws near. It is a very humane way uh, for someone to leave this world to not have to endure that much pain for that amount of time. And anybody who would argue me, with me on, in that case, uh, I would just tell you I'm not even going to argue with you about it. I've seen people... Um, Brother Joe Polite died of cancer and basically the last few weeks of his life, he was basically just so out of it on morphine, he did not know anything which is the best way to go. And there's nothing evil about that, there's nothing sinful about that, there's definitely nothing wrong about that and, um, and I stand behind that. So... Uh, continue to pray for Roy and Bonnie. Uh, I prayed with Roy and certainly God knows he has our permission. He doesn't need our permission, but God has our permission. If he wants to heal Bonnie, he certainly may. Um, but anyway, just pray for them both that God would bless them. As I mentioned this morning, Bonnie was here at the beginning of the Watchman ministry. She was the one that if you were the first one to receive any of our DVDs in the mail, that was done by the hand of Bonnie. And then later Roy came and uh, started helping her out. And uh, what a blessing they have been to us over the years. And um, we're certainly going to miss Sister Bonnie, but you pray for Brother Roy and pray for them both that God would bless them. Acts chapter 18. Um, just very quickly, I'll read a portion of this to you. And then tonight, I, I promised you that I was going to uh, sort of give you a, a teaching on how I believe a person becomes 
infected or possessed with a devil. Uh, we have been studying angels. The Lord appeared unto uh, him in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he left, lift up his eyes, looked in, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Uh, certainly angels and the Lord were not in any need of rest. They have far superior bodies than we do. But it was customary, as it would be now, if someone came to our house from, and we knew they had traveled a long journey, we would greet them, say, come on in, have a seat, make yourself at home. Um, and, if, and especially if they were company expected, then we would have already had a meal made and prepared for them and say, okay, y'all come and eat. And we would sit down with them and eat with them and break bread with them and talk with them and speak with them and then offer them pie and cake and uh, by the way, uh, Callie, I told, I took the two pieces of pie over to Roy and I said, one of these is Bonnie's and one of these is yours unless Bonnie's asleep. <laughs> so it looks like Roy gets two pieces of Callie. Callie is our church, is our new official church cake maker. Yes, sir, Bob. She is an outstanding cake maker. So anyway, um, so verse 8, verse 7, Abram ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good, gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them and stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son, and Sarah heard it in the tent which was behind him. Let's uh, stop and pray. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessings, that you would add them unto your word tonight. Give us light, knowledge, and understanding. Pray to Father, Lord, that you would continue to bless Brother Roy. Uh, being, in, being able to be with Bonnie, even though she is in the hospital, in the condition that she's in, Lord, it did seem like his spirits were up. And I believe, Father, that came from you. I believe, Lord, you blessed him from heaven. And uh, I just pray, God, Lord, that you would continue that. Uh, Lord, I know Roy and I know his, some of his weaknesses and frailties. And, and Father, I just pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just uplift him and bless him and help him uh, as he goes through this time. Just be with him, be with Bonnie. Father, if it, if it is indeed your will that she pass from this life, we know, God, that she has a house in heaven not made with hands. And we, Father, know, Lord, that that body will suffer no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more disease, no more sin, thus no more death. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that you would bless Sister Bonnie, if not heal her. As far as the cancer is concerned, then heal her permanently so that she can live with you forever. That's why she got saved when she got saved for this particular time. Pray, Father, that you'd bless her tonight. Be with those, Lord, that have prayed today. Be with their uh, needs. I pray, God, that you'd bless them in a wonderful way. Thank you, God, for being our God, for loving us the way you have. Father, Lord, teach us some great and mighty things from your word, dear God, that we not ever be oppressed, depressed, possessed by devils, by Satan. Lord, just open up your word to us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, we touched on the issue, and Brother Mike Hutzel and I had uh, se several opportunities to visit with one another. I love to visit us preachers when we get together. We always talk shop, and um, 
kind of feel one another out, which one, what one believes about certain subjects and so on. And he and I agree on a lot of things. And especially when it comes to can Christians be possessed by devils? The answer is absolutely unequivocally no. We do not believe that Christians can be possessed by devils. If you belong to God, you do you belong to God. He owns you. He crowns you. He sits on the throne in your life and your heart and he rules out of your heart. And there's no mistaking that. And God's throne ha does not have two seats on it. One for the, you know, good angel on one shoulder and one for the bad angel on the other shoulder. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't happen that way. There's only one. There's only room for one in your heart. And no man can serve two masters. Which is an interesting question to ask if you know somebody. And this was brought to me at, at several years ago at a meeting in Harrison. One of the men there asked me, he said, Pastor, I got a good one for you. I don't know if you've ever thought of this or not, but if you ever meet anybody that's a Mason and they go to church, they want to justify Masonry, ask them, can you serve two masters? How is it that you can get away with serving two masters when the Bible says obviously you can't? Because we either serve Christ or we serve a man in the lodge that is sitting on a throne called the worshipful master. And I went, I never thought of that. That's pretty good. But he's right. Um, a pastor that I know that many of you know, his father used to be a master mason. And he told him, son, this is back before he got saved and right with God. He said, son, you need to join the lodge. Dad, why do I got to do that? And he said, well, it's good for business. It'll get, you'll always have a job somewhere if you need it. You can always borrow money, any kind of money you need. You just, it's just the way to get through life. So he said, here I am lost. I'm going through my first initiation. I'm going through the Blue Lodge. And he said, they take me in there, they blindfold me, tell me I'm blinded, I can't see anything. And he said, they raise one leg, uh, pant leg up, that one rolled down, one sleeve up, the other one rolled down. They unbutton my shirt to where part of my chest is covered, the other part of my chest is bare. And I understand the symbolism of all that, it has to do with the union of opposites, and I won't get into that. But he said, they had, they told me to kneel, so I'm knelt, and they're reading all this junk in front of me. And then they took the blindfold off, and here I am knelt in front of a man that I had been calling, and they had been calling him the worshipful master. And this pastor said, I got up out of that place, and he said, this is not of God. I will not, I will not serve this master in this place. And he walked out. This particular pastor, you can guess, you can try to guess who it is. This particular pastor then from that point started having tracks in his church from Chick Publications that were anti-Masonic tracks. So he was sitting in the local town cafeteria, the little eating place in town. And two of his former lodge buddies came to him and they said, You've got some literature in your church that you need to get rid of. And he said, what is that? And they named it. They for, I forgot what the name of it was. But he looked him, he, he stood up, looked him right in the eye. And he said, I'm not taking that literature out. You know that I was at one time a member of your lodge. They said, yes. And he said, I know your secrets. And he said, I'm going to tell everybody I know what goes on inside that lodge. And he said, what are you going to do about it to stop me? Are you going to slit my throat from ear to ear? Are you going to open up my bowels and pull my bowels out of my body and burn them to ashes and then sprinkle the ashes to the four corners of the earth? Because that's part of the Masonic oath that they take. And when he started in on that, they got mad and left. And I, and I asked him, I said, weren't you afraid? And he said, Mike, all you have to do is turn the light on to these people. He said, they live in a world of darkness. They do not want light shined on all their little secrets. And he said, all you have to do is turn the light on and they'll leave. That's exactly what happened.
Amen. Uh, but anyway, you cannot be possessed by the Holy Spirit of God, have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you. In fact, turn to uh, Genesis chapter 2. There's uh, not Genesis chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. As I'm bringing these subjects up now, the Lord's bringing me scripture. And I, Lord, I appreciate you doing that. Thank you for very much for doing that for me. Because I've, I mean, I've studied this issue for years. Trying to understand how someone becomes possessed. Ephesians chapter 2, turn there. The Bible says, you hath he quickened, which is past tense. Did you know that according to God, you have already been resurrected? If you are truly saved, and God knows which one of you are, which one of you ain't. If you are truly saved, you have already been resurrected. He already knows who you are. He already knows that you've been resurrected. Even if it hasn't happened yet, he already knows if you've been born again or not. Because even though, even though you don't have the new body that's, that is given to us when we are born again, you are still, God knows whether or not you're born again or not. And he said, you hath he quickened. He's already made you alive again to your death and he already sees he already knows who it is who were dead in trespasses and sins where in time past you walked according to the course of this world according to Thor and I about flipped out of my chair two weeks ago I'm studying Manly Palmer Hall's book the secret teachings of all ages and I can't remember what I was looking for, but I came across the paragraph that mentioned Thor, the god of thunder, who is the prince of the power of the air. And I just about fell backward in my chair. I went, I've never heard anybody call him that. But that's exactly who he is. He's right. He's the god of thunder. He's the prince of the power of the air. So look at your Bible again. Where in time you walk? Where in time past she walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So what the charismatic movement would say to you is you can have a devil possessing you and you can be a child of disobedience. But simultaneously be a child of obedience in faith to God by Jesus Christ. They're saying that you can be one, you can be both ways at the same time. By the way, it's that same crowd that says God is both male and female in the same body. That is, I don't even like to say that people say that. I think just saying it's anathema. That's wicked to say that, amen. And by the way, God did not make Adam both male and female and then pull out of him the female half. That is a lie. That is not what your Bible says. I don't care who said it. I don't care what book you read. Rick Warren has said it. Kenneth Copeland has said it. Kenneth Hagin has said it. Probably Finnis Dake has said it. I'm telling you, it's a big fat lie. You cannot serve two masters. It is impossible. Now, we talked last Sunday about those who were possessed of devils. How did they get possessed of devils? And I'm talking to even young people. Now, the Bible doesn't say how young they were. I don't believe they were infants. I don't believe they were toddlers. I don't believe that they were four-year-old, five-year-old. I believe that they had aged somewhat past the age of accountability. How old was King Manasseh when he started getting into the occult and performing the forbidden practices that God told him not to do? How old was he? Anybody remember? I only did like 35 Watchmen broadcasts on this one. It was 12. He was 12 years old. And at 12 years old, being king, he was already an adept. That word means 
He was very proficient at magic, witchcraft, contacting familiar spirits, the occult, and all, and all of that that goes along with it. He was already an adept at it. He was very good at it. He's gifted at it. At the age of 12, he's already a practitioner of magic and witchcraft. I've told you about the pastor. He's now gone on to be with the Lord. A missionary, a missionary, home missionary, told, asked him, he said, have you read the Harry Potter book yet? It was when they first come out, the new one, the first one. He said, no, why? Isn't that full of witchcraft? He said, oh, there's nothing wrong with it. So he said, man, no, I haven't. I don't know about this. So he said, I went to the public library Checked it out of the library and he said, I read it from cover to cover and I closed the book and I wanted to be a warlock. He said, I wanted to, I wanted to practice sorcery right then and there. And this was a man who was in his 40s, had been in the ministry for at least 10 years. And uh, was, had become a pastor and some sin fell into his life and... He had to leave that. He got killed in a car accident after that. But I do believe he had made things right with God. He, he, was, he, was, he had stayed with his wife. So I think, I'm pretty sure he made things right with his wife. But anyway, he said, after reading Harry Potter, I closed the book and said, yeah, I want to go, go be a warlock. And that was an adult man. I'm telling you, children, Harry Potter was inspired to this woman to grab the attention of children and young people to teach them heretical witchcraft ways. It is those ways that I believe that young people can become possessed. Let me tell you about a young man by the name of Sean Sellers. Does, anybody, does that name sound familiar to Brother Chris? You remember that name? Does that sound familiar to you? Sean Sellers. When I was in Bible college in Oklahoma, he was on death row at the time. And I worked at a little church um, in um, central eastern Oklahoma. There was McAllister, Indianola, Oklahoma, uh, Poto, Oklahoma, just some towns along the Arkansas, Oklahoma border. And one of the men in the church was, he had, he had a company that designed grave markers and inscribed them. And he showed me Sean Sellers' parents' gravestones. So I, I have somewhat of a connection with this story. Sean Sellers, when he was about 16 or 17 years old, uh, uh, let me back up. When he was about 14 or 15 years old, he got talked into playing this fantasy role-playing game at the time called Dungeons and Dragons. And this is before computers. This was before the internet. They played them with cards. And you literally became the character that, you know, that you chose in this game. You could become a warlock. You could become a knight. You could become a king or whatever it was. And the more that he got into this gaming of playing Dungeons and Dragons, the more the devil took over his mind and his thinking. And one night in a, and I believe in a satanic infested rage, he murdered his mother his stepfather left their dead bodies and went down to the local 7-Eleven to get a drink, to get a big gulp and shot and killed the convenience store clerk in cold blood. They had his trial. They tried him as an adult. Oklahoma is sort of like Texas when it comes to that stuff. They tried him as an adult and the death penalty was on the table and they found him guilty of first degree murder of all three murders and put him, he was the youngest person on death row at the time. This was 1985-ish. 
And after a while of being in prison, um, a, a minister had gone to see him. And he finally gave his life over to the Lord. And he asked the warden of the prison to allow, after a while, the, whoever was working with him and the chaplain convinced the warden to allow him to do uh, certain news interviews to warn young people, don't get involved with these games. They're dangerous. He said, I now can see how the devil entered into my life by being part of of these role-playing games because you actually think in your mind that you are these characters and people that was just them with a game and a set of dice and some cards today it's done electronically on xboxes and ipads and phones and all these other gaming devices that young people have access to it's the same satanic indoctrination only now it's visual now it's more real now they need very little imagination they have it painted right there in front of them okay um but anyway he i think he was eventually i don't remember how it all turned out he i i don't know if he was eventually executed or the governor of oklahoma stayed his execution and gave him life in prison i don't remember how it turned out somebody can look that up for me sean Sean Sellers, I think it was, was his name, S-E-A-N. I think that's how his name was spelled, Oklahoma Death Roll. You can look that up and see, and see what happened to him. But it was through the gaming that he was, through the games that he was playing, that Satan infested him and caused him to kill in cold blood his own mother. And he paid the price for it. Okay. Now. Um, let's see here. Turn to Isaiah chapter 13. Turn to Isaiah 13 and hold your place there. Some of you who. I mean I've taught this many times. If you listen to me throughout the week. I will talk about this quite a bit. But. Some of you who have not. This is a teaching I think you need. Turn to Isaiah 13, hold your place there. Did you ever find out? He was executed. Listen, and I believe, he, I believe he's in heaven. There is still an earthly penalty to pay. Him getting saved did not remove him from the, his legal obligation under the death penalty. And he understood that. He understood that. He said, I know they're going to kill me. I know they're going to execute me. I'm not doing this to play some role to try to get out of being executed. I'm honestly, and that's what he was accused of by people. Oh, he's putting on to get off the death penalty. No, he said, I know they're still going to execute me and they need to. What I did was I broke the law. But let me tell you why I did it. Let me tell you how I ended up this way. And while he was alive, he tried to warn as many people as possible through the interviews that he did. Don't mess around with these games. Card captors, any kind of those card games like that, stay away from them. That's cartomancy. The word mancy is a form of wizardry. Like, like necromancy. It is being, it is using witchcraft or wizardry it is using the power of the dead to perform magic and witchcraft like the like the other bethel church out in redding california sending people out to literally lay on top of the graves of saints who have died to pull their anointing up out of the grave and put it on themselves because they have leftover anointing from God that was unused. They died in an, at an early time. And, the, and it's called grave sucking. It is a, and they do it. And let me tell you where they got that from. They got that from the Jewish rabbis. The Jewish rabbis for the past 2,000 years. Go to former Jewish sage. Wise rabbi teachers. And try to receive of their spirit. To be in them so that they could have the wisdom that that rabbi had in his lifetime. And that's necromancy. That's something that God forbid. 
And here is these Jewish rabbis doing it. You don't think Jesus knew what he was talking about when he called them, you are full of dead men's bones? He knew exactly what he was talking about. Hold your place there in Isaiah uh, 13 and go to Genesis 9. We're looking at how, how can someone be possessed of a devil? I'm going to rest my hips a little bit. They're hurting quite a bit today. Hips and my knees and back and so on. No, I'm fine. Chair would make me sit like way down on the floor. Uh, Genesis chapter 9. God said this in verse 2. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. And upon, notice this, let's count this. Number one, every beast of the earth. Number two, every fowl of the air. Number three, and upon all that moveth upon the earth. Number four, and upon all the fishes of the sea. How many, we, how many groups we got? Four. So anytime you see the number four, you're looking at the spiritual realm. Now, Matthew, do you remember that guy, that preacher taking you down to that catfish pond to feed those catfish? Did they come up? Oh. Okay. That was the cutest thing I ever saw in my life. Matthew, ease it down that hill. Because the preacher, he owned two catfish ponds. And he said, if I walk down by myself, they know it's me. And I can throw that catfish feed out. And he said, look like the water's boiling. Just boiling with catfish. But he said, if my wife comes down with me, they know there's somebody else there with me. They won't come up and touch it. So Matthew, he's going to take Matthew. Matthew's just little, he's just, he just little bitty back then. Okay? So Matthew's easing down that hill. And that preacher starts throwing that catfish food out. No, they won't touch it. They could sense that somebody was there with that preacher and they wouldn't touch it. They would have starved to death before they ate that. Okay? This Bible's right. Now, if we were to take this up one level, are devils afraid of men? Mankind? The answer is no. They're not afraid of us. Satan wasn't afraid of Job. By himself, he wasn't. In fact, Satan wanted the ability to take Job's life. And God told Satan, you can't take his life. You can take away everything he's got. You can affect his body. You can't kill him. Don't you do it. So Satan is not afraid of a mortal man. However, he is, he is afraid and every spirit under him is afraid of Jesus Christ. Very afraid. So now, Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13 is about Babylon. And anytime you're talking about Babylon, you're talking about the absence of Jesus Christ. A place where Jesus Christ does not exist. By the way, humans are houses. Are we not? In Revelation 4, you have the 24 elders. Those are the 24 ribs that surround the throne of God. Our ribs surround our body. The four chamber heart are the four living creatures that support the throne of God. The, uh, the seven candlesticks are the seven from your trachea tube going into your two lungs. You have seven branches that when you turn it right side up, it looks like a tree. And think about this. Think, think about this, Gary. What do trees do as far as air is concerned? What do they do? The leaves, if you know the answer. Okay. The leaves of every tree in the world take in carbon dioxide and they release what? Oxygen. What do our lungs do? Take in oxygen and release what? 
the exact opposite. Isn't that something? So if you take the bronchial, and they call it the brachial or bronchial tree. And if you turn it upside down, it looks like a tree. And it has seven branches on it, just like the seven golden candlesticks in the temple of God in heaven. So now watch this. Your body is a house. It is a house that God built. It is the house of God. If that house... If in that house, Jesus does not reside, then there is always the chance that a devil then will come and move in that house with the owner's permission. And I believe that it must be by permission. Even if it's just... They don't know exactly what they're doing, but they know they're messing with evil stuff. Then devils will come and take in and take over. So as Isaiah 13, verse 19, Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Now stop right there. What was Lot's occupation when he was with Abraham? He was your shepherd, wasn't he? In fact, that's what got the fight going. Was the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham began to strive with one another. Did God eventually remove from Sodom the shepherd in the form of Lot? Shh. Well, this Bible's right, isn't it? Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there. Wild beasts. Their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. You know what that means? You know what the word doleful means? You know what a, do you know what a dove sounds like, right? When doves cry. It, that's what Prince named that song after. And it's whoo, whoo. It sounds like someone crying and wailing over someone who died. Okay? That's what doves sound like. Doleful creatures and owls shall dwell there. The Hebrew word here in, for owls in this particular place is Lilith. Does anybody know who Lilith was? Huh? Okay, really? Well, here's what I know about Lilith. According to Hebrew legends, not the Bible, Lilith was a hag spirit who the Jewish rabbis claim was Adam's first wife. And she was angry that Adam would not come in unto her and produce children through her. So she left him and left him without a wife. And God then created Eve for Adam. But Lilith herself is a spirit, a hag spirit. Any, in in any, any place in the world where there is a witch who is a hag-looking, kind of old bat lady-looking, weird, ugly, with a wart on her nose thing. And that's universal. She's Lilith. That's who she is. The owls shall dwell there, and satyrs, which are part human, part beast, shall dance there. And wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate what? The house is desolate, because the man, Jesus, does not live there any longer. Now, I believe that there are still areas in this country where maybe everybody's not saved, but at least they still believe in God and country. 
They're the ones at the, at the um, tractor pulls who remove their hat when the prayer is said at the beginning. Okay? But I also believe that there are places in those same areas where meth is involved, drugs is involved, prostitution is involved. I believe, go, I believe spirits dwell in those areas and are heavy in those areas. Asheville, North Carolina is one of them. That's where Antifa was doing all their protests in North Carolina. When I called my cousin who lived in Zebulon, North Carolina... He just said, Mike, I won't tell you a whole lot, but I'll just tell you that we got a bunch of guys with a bunch of guns and we have text message signals. And if they start anything, we're ready to go. Amen. Amen. Wild beasts of the island shall cry in their houses. And dragons in their palaces. Dragons are serpent devils, fiery flying serpents. Dragons are, the Satan is a dragon. So I believe there are other devils, evil angels, that have a dragon type appearance. And it's interesting that in the Western world, dragons are all evil. In the Eastern world, in the Orient, dragons are all good gods, aren't they? They worship dragons over there. And their time is coming to near and their days shall not be prolonged. Isaiah 34, for time's sake, basically says the same thing. Verse 14, wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered and every one with her mate. These are all unclean animals that the Israelites were forbidden to eat. Unclean birds. Remember what Revelation 18 said about Babylon and what Babylon was. She was a hold of every unclean and hateful bird. Vultures, owls. Any kind of bird that ate flesh was an unclean bird. Huh? Thank God for chicken. Amen. Amen. Now, look at Luke 11 and I'll let you go. Luke chapter 11. I think I know why my back hurts so bad. Luke chapter 11. Verse, 20, verse 16. And others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his... They were asking them this because they said, Well, he's full of devils, but he's casting out devils. And he's, he's bringing it up. How can I, if I'm full of devils, how can I cast out devils? Why should I? If I'm being controlled by devils, why should I cast out devils? That's contradictory to my kingdom then. But he said, verse 20, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now listen to what he says. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Now look at verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. And unclean spirits can possess a man. If that man is without Christ and participating in unclean things. Yes, sir. Gary, if you are truly born again, I believe that backsliding is possible, but God is with you in the backsliding. He's, he's going to let you see 
how bad things can get. And then he's going to take a, a rod very gently and bring you back where you belong. Right? Because that's what he did with me. Sound familiar? Okay. But if that person was never really saved to begin with, when they go back out, it's the Bible, Peter says it's worse than it was from them. It's going to be worse this time than it was in the beginning. And that's what he says here. That's, look at what he says. Verse 24, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. The unclean spirit does. Seeking rest and finding none. Cause, why? Because he doesn't have a house to live in. And he says, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him. And notice that it said the word house. It first called it a man, then it called it a house. When he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh him to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And I believe that, I do believe in haunted houses, haunted mountains, haunted forests, uh, groves. This is why God said, cut those groves down. Why did God say that? Because he knew that devils congregated and inhabited those groves. He knew they literally did. Where did the Druids meet? Anybody know? The Druid priests of ancient England and Ireland and Scotland. Where did they always have their services? In the woods. Usually in oak groves. Because oak tree was very sacred to them. But they went out there, not in the city, out in the forest. They went out there because that's where all the gods were. That's where the devils were. And that's where they derived their magic and thus their power over the people in the city. You see, those Druid priests went out there to gain that power. And I believe that there are people in this world who crave power. I mean, my first contact with witchcraft was through the comic books that I read and the full page ad that advertised a book on witchcraft by Gavin and Elaine Frost. And the headline was, so easy a child can do it. And I guarantee you, if I could have figured out a way to order that book, number one, I didn't have enough money, never did. That was like a $2 book. I could never get $2. And if I could figure out a way to have that book delivered to my house without my mama knowing about it, I would have ordered it. And at a young age, I would have learned how, by using witchcraft, to have power in my life with other people. But what I would not knowingly be doing, I would, I would be opening up the door that keeps devils out of my body I would have been opening that door up to allow them in anytime I hear of a preacher saying that he does yoga he's allowing devils into him preachers going on ayahuasca journeys people that are doing yoga people that are practicing transcendental meditation, people that are doing all sorts of occult mystic things. They're basically opening up their house. They've removed Christ already. And the devils come in and once they gain control, you can't, they can't get them out. Only Christ can deliver them. That's what I believe. Let's stand to our feet. Father, I believe you protected every one of us in some, some area of our life, Father, from our house being inhabited, thus controlled by devils. 
And Father, we have a lot to be thankful for, and that's one of them. Thank you, God, for hearing us, for when we cried for salvation, for protecting us, for keeping our house safe, for allowing us to know when the thief was going to come to try to rob our house so that we stood guard and said, not on our watch. Thank you for Jesus being in our hearts so the devil can't come in. Lord, bless your word tonight and bless these people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.